Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Well, we've done it, I guess. We've uh, finally gotten to the point where this uh, series has kind of gone beyond the point that I was planning to read. Still thoughts about doing something else. Just fun little curiosity here. I, I, I tried reading some Dragonlance books, and I went through some, and I think I even finished a couple of them, but overall, oh man. I just find Dragonlance really, really dull as compared to the realms. I, I don't know what it is. Like, I know that I read, you know, Chronicles uh, when I was much younger, and I enjoyed them for the most part, but that was also around the time that I enjoyed Crystal Shards, so obviously my tastes have changed. I am somewhat tempted to try the Pathfinder stuff because I've read some more of that and I'm really digging it, or maybe, uh, God forbid, try out the Warhammer stuff, which is uh, difficult as all hell at this point, but I'm just doing that on Goodreads. If you're not following me on Goodreads, gordoncole at gmail.com, you can find me. Come be my friend, because I like friends, and I thank you guys for listening. We are now in year 1484. Fifth edition is starting up, and it is super exciting because everybody loves fifth edition, even though nobody liked fourth edition except for me. But I'm also very high on some painkillers because I screwed up my back. So forgive me if I sound a little loopy, but I was just uh, not in a place where I could really do my official audiobook stuff right now. So I thought, what the hell, I'll get this one out because I read a couple more books. Let's start with Godborn. This is the end of the Night Cycle. This was originally intended to be a trilogy. It's by Paul S. Kemp. But Paul had a bit of a falling out with Wizards uh, over payment, apparently. I thought that was pretty awesome that he was just open about that on his blog and everything. Uh, they just, they are not paying people as much, and that's probably why we're seeing a lot of realms authors who went over to star wars i assume they pay more i tried reading kemp's old republic star wars novel and oh wow i uh i was not a fan but i did like his uh what is it Eagle and nix i did like that stuff so if you have a chance check that out anyway back to the realms you know, I, I was a little terrified to read this because the end to whichever was the third in the Storm trilogy, uh, Shadow Storm, or was that the first one? Or no, Shadow. It, it was. It's. It's not all three storms. It's all three Shadow something, right? What Shadow Realm? Whatever. Whatever the third one was, was probably you know in my top three of books that I've read from the realms, and so I was like, oh, can this beat that out? It definitely didn't beat it out, but it wasn't a disappointment by any stretch of the imagination. The book starts and everything just zooms along, man. We are at full pitch for the first, I don't know, 50 or so pages. I read it on a Kindle, so I'm guessing there. And I'll have to say, even though the book is really short as compared to a lot of the other stuff, like especially pairing this with The Adversary by Aaron M. Evans, I'll get to that in a minute, but especially pairing it with that, which is just, uh, her books just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. This just flew by, and I'm okay with that, because I loved it, but it was a little frustrating because at times I wanted to spend more time with it. Mask steps in before his supposed death at the end of 3rd edition, and he pushes the woman, what, what's her name, Vara? Vasa? Something, something like that. Uh, a lot of the names sounded too similar in this for me um, because like for instance Vazen is Erevis's son and uh, but anyway uh, Vasa Vara is the mother and at the beginning Mask shunts her forward in time because he knows that Vazen the child who doesn't have a name yet but you know Vazen the child will become very very important for resurrecting Erevis which is part of Mask's plan to come back himself so he does that we follow Baron Urbeza for a chapter, and bam, then we're off to Mags, and we we basically get that scene that starts at the end of the, you know, that, that epilogue was the only thing that happened in 4th edition, and we get the rest of that scene, and a big fight, and Riven's there, and it's all exciting, and Riven is now kind of like one-third a god. Rivelin? No, uh, not Rivelin, uh, his son. Tant Tant Tantalus? Tant Tanthus? Damn it. Uh, forgetting the names here, um, 
the the you know the Shadowvar who killed his mother. Uh, he's the other third, and who's the third third? Now I can't even remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Point being, Riven, Drasic Riven is super awesome now, and he helps Mags fight some guys, and then Mags goes off, and Mags realizes that the source is dying. And he communes with it, and he's like, hey, buddy, can you help me out one last time? The source is like, okay. Or no, I guess that comes later. At first, he's just hanging out with it. So from there, we follow. We kind of get into the main plot, which uh, revolves around, I would say, five characters. I don't know. You've got Vazen, who is now, I don't think he's a cleric, but he's like a, like a, is he a paladin? Maybe he's a paladin of... Amanater, um, and he's protecting the seer in this hidden uh, valley fortress. The seer basically tells everyone to leave, and uh, so he goes off with this guy who he meets called Orson, and Orson is, I don't know, I had forgotten about him, but I eventually kind of remembered him. He's, he's part of, he's a descendant of that group of guys who were like fighting ninjas or like ninja fighters for mask and everything. So he goes off with him and Orson is probably uh, my favorite character because he's super fun. Like he's, y you know, Kemp likes to write these somewhat crazy characters and Orson is our somewhat crazy character for this book. He always has to make lines in the dirt whenever they start on a journey, and it's all about, like, beginnings and endings for him. And it kind of reminded me of the whole, like, you know, um, you're a prime number and all those sorts of things. There's this one point where he talks with Vazen on the journey, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, <laughs> it's kind of made me feel a little bit like it was PC Glow, but it works. Vazen's eyes grew heavy. He leaned back and floated on the notes of Orson's tune. I'm glad you accompanied me back, he said to the diva. We've journeyed together often, Vazen Kale. In another age, we walked side by side into the volcanic den of Harastafan, the Dragon Sage, although we bore different names then. And I had to go look that up. I was like, is that a thing that happened anywhere for real in the realms? And I couldn't find it, but I think that's cool. I thought it was a fun way to make it so that, like, he fits with the group. And, of course, it's, like, someone who believes in Amanater and someone who believes in Mask working together. And it's always fun to see those sorts of uh, group dynamics and everything. We also follow uh, Brennus, the other um, shade child of Riv Riven, Rivalin. See, I'm getting them mixed up, and the book actually got it mixed up, too. I, I highlighted that point, and I just wanted to point that out. There's this section where it says, Kale lurched to his feet, stabbed with weave shear, but Riven sidestepped the blow, grabbed Kale by the cloak, and slammed him against the pedestal. He's fighting Rivelin at that point. And so, okay, yeah, Rivelin is the, Rivelin's the child who killed his mother. Brennus is his brother who's trying to get back at him, but now that Rivelin's like a third of a god, he has no way to get around him. Brennus is fun. He's got a couple of homunculi who are just kind of cute and ridiculous. And their father is Tantal Tantalus? Tant Tantalus. Tantathus. Tanta. Whatever. In any case, we follow Brennus and his homunculi and all of his plans. He's just trying to kill his brother. That's his main goal. But in the end, everybody's goals intertwine and yada, yada, yada. And I, again, I spoil stuff in here, so I don't care. But they, they resurrect Erebus and they uh, fight and take down... Mephistopheles, who is vying for Asmodeus' seat, and this was something that I thought was nice. If you guys have been following 4th edition like I have, uh, you'll see that Asmodeus has been a bigger and bigger deal. Like, he uh, is apparently now the super number one king of hell, and um, I guess it was shared before or whatever, but now he's in ascendancy, and so a lot of people are trying to take over for him. And we've seen this in other stuff. Most notably, I remember it in Aaron Evans' stuff, probably because I read the adversary afterward this, and it had references to a lot of that. But whatever. The other person who uh, goes on this journey with Orson and Vazen is Garrick, who's uh, essentially a ranger. He's a guy from a village. And his story is really upsetting, even though I knew it was going to go the way that it went. Like, I, I knew, I was like, oh, this is, this is going to end horribly, and I think I know where it's going. And I was about 65% right, 70, maybe 70% right. And anyway, it was upsetting to read. I cried. I think I might have cried a little at the end as well. Kemp has a way of just really pulling the heartstrings even when it's obvious. There's a point, there's a thing in the epilogue with Riven, and it's like, oh my god. 
Anyway, it's all about resurrecting Erebus so that he can fight Mephistopheles, and that will bring Mask back. And of course, they also have to stop the cycle of night, because uh, Rivlin is using the, what is it, the Book of Eternal Night or whatever it was, which, if I remember correctly, first showed up in that Richard Lee Byers book, The Black Book, or something like that, and um, everything seemed to tie together, and it was pretty awesome. But, yeah, they, you know, they have to stop that, or else the world completely ends, which would be weird in book two out of a six-book series. Um, we get a lot of mention of their wars in the Dales, like things are in upheaval, and, you know, Mask comes back, and a lot of other crazy stuff happens. Mephistopheles gets overthrown. Like, he's only out for a thousand years or whatever it is, but uh, it, it this whole thing doesn't go his way, and so he's obviously not going to be the power that takes over for Asmodeus, so whatever. I'm really, really glad that this book got to happen. I'm glad that Kemp came back even for it. It was tough to feel anything amazing about the book because it did, in a lot of ways, feel as if Kemp was kind of tick-marking off a lot of things, uh, and you could see that going th coming through here and there, but I don't feel like he shortchanged it. I just feel like it was probably with a lot of kind of trepidation that he did this, but the book still stands even though it does fly by at the speed of light. Like, seriously, it just zooms by, except for the Saeed and his brother sections. Those felt like they bogged down a bit here and there, but it was fun to see the devil cats. And speaking of devil cats, Riven has his dogs, and I love this line from Riven because it seems so Riven and it's also like a dog metaphor which I thought was fun I'm assuming this is him talking to Mephistopheles uh, Riven sneered shadows boiling around him in an angry cloud that's a high-pitched bark you have lapdog yap yap I was like oh, I love that and there's another quote that I put aside just because I loved it there's room for regret in everything Oh, such a great line, and it really, like, tells you what you need to know about that character, right? So, yeah, I really dug this book. I had been warned, or not really warned, I had, I had kind of sussed out through reading a lot of different stuff that the Sundering is not so much of kind of like one event as a lot of others uh, of the realm, uh, what is it, the realm... RSE, Realm Shaking Events, Realm, whatever it is, you know, that they used to do all the time. It's not so much that as just kind of like there's stuff in the background that everybody's dealing with. And that's, I assume, the wars and the dales and just upheaval with the gods and some of them coming back and yada, 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 whatever. So I dug it. The one thing that I will say is that this was, this almost felt like a peck and paw film at times because. For the most part, our, like, hero journey is these three dudes hanging out together, and then they get help from another dude and another dude, and they resurrect a dude to fight a dude, and it's like, oh, and they also have to fight two other dudes. And it's like, <laughs> I think you could swing a lot of dead cats and not hit a woman except Vara Vasu who starts the whole thing off, and basically she's just there to give birth and die. Uh, which is very unusual for Kemp, because he usually writes really strong, interesting, forefront women, I think. And, and he also deals with feminist themes quite often in his fiction, and I'm a fan of that, but I, you know, what the hell. Like, I really like this, too. I like me some peck and paw, just as, as I've got a friend who says, it, uh, I, I, I like boy things. So, uh, yeah, so it's like, this is very boy. Let's move on to The Adversary by Aaron M. Evans. That is the third book in the Sundering sextology. Okay, first off, I just want to say that The Gilded Rune, you know, nobody knows where that uh, takes place because it has no date and so on and so forth. It's obviously got to be fourth edition or later because of the chasm in the Underdark. I think Gilded Rune takes place after Godborn, and probably pretty soon after Godborn. My reason for thinking that is at the end of Godborn, uh, Sikor's Falls, and that's one of the big things that happens there. And Sikor, after Sikor's Falls, it's mentioned in Adversary that earth motes start appearing and either falling or just appearing there all over the place. And in Gilded Rune, there's an earth mote in the sky that nobody says is attached to that event, but... 
it seems like just kind of weird that it would be there and nobody would think it was odd that it just happened to come along. So I'm pretty sure the Gilded Rune happens in somewhere in the 18, or 1484-1486 area. That's, that's what I'm going to say. So it worked out pretty well, right? Here's the thing about Adversary, and I kind of meant to go back and listen to my other stuff before I said this, and I forgot to, so apologies if I've already said this, but with Adversary, it really hit me. What Aaron is doing with this series is not what I thought it would be after the first one. It is, in fact, what would generally be termed urban fantasy. Um, I mean, this isn't so much urban because we're in this medieval setting, but it has all the trappings of, say... And and give me a second to explain this, but it has all the trappings of, say, a Twilight, stuff like that, because it's about someone who's kind of the good girl and kind of not special and everything, finding out, oh my god, I do have magic blood, and there's this guy who's kind of evil, but for some reason when he's around me, he acts better because this is how things happen and yada yada yada. And I realized, you know, I don't like that genre. So no wonder I've been steadily not enjoying these books as much as I did the first one. I stayed with with this one for a lot longer than I did the last one, and that was because there was kind of an interesting uh, thing that happened pretty quickly out of the gate here, in that um, the last book we read, I guess, was about seven years ago, not, not real time, but in the realms. I, I didn't realize it had been that long, Ironically, because it had been so long since I recorded, so I didn't, you know, it didn't quite click, but uh, the first few chapters or whatever take place back then, and it winds up that Faraday makes this deal with Cerche, so that Cerche gets their soul, because Faraday is rock stupid, and uh, Cerche, part of the deal is that she agrees to protect them for the next ten years, so she zonks them all out. And puts them in cages, and they sleep for seven years. So then they wake up, uh, basically so that they can be in the Sundering rather than six years in the past or whatever it is. So I was like, oh, okay, we're just going to jettison all the old plot lines. And I am A-OK with that because I was bored to tears with them. But we don't. Uh, there may be a three or four chapters that have to do with like them kind of trying to fit into the new life, but eventually it's just, I don't know, eventually it just kind of falls into routine. And there are kind of three aspects to this book. There's the romance, which I wanted to showcase with this line. All she could think of was how he'd kissed her, how much she wanted him to kiss her again, how easy it would be to just put everything else out of mind if he pulled her close against him again. And it's like, okay, I mean, so this is a, you know, a fairy romance sort of novel, and that's totally cool because those are very popular, and I think that's a really smart way to go with it. I don't want to read it. I'm going to give the next one a chance simply because the description of it sounds like it could be interesting, and if it ties into the end of the book, which was the one plot line that I cared about, kind of dangling a cliffhanger there, then I'm like, okay, okay, I, maybe I could get back into this, but we'll see. Um, I mean, it's coming up next, Fire in the Blood, so we'll see, and uh, uh, here's hoping, right? Because obviously, as I've said again and again and again, I want to enjoy the things that I'm reading. This one I cannot get into. So we have the romance, we have the kind of sundering plot line, which is all about this uh, guy collecting the Chosen of Asmodeus, and uh, I don't even remember what he was doing with them, because here's the thing, the the third plot line, which kind of, you know, weaves everything together, is that Cersei, part of the deal is she's going to have Faraday do, I, I think it's too favorous for her, and they don't involve killing, and they don't involve... I, I can't remember the other one, but essentially it can't be, like, evil, super super obviously evil or whatever. So Faraday, uh, so she tells him to go help this guy choose these chosen, essentially, but she doesn't tell her anything about the assignment just to make Faraday be all like, oh my god, I don't know what's going on, I'm all helpless, and blah 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 blah. And I, when I got to this point in the book, I was like, oh, I don't give a shit about her, like, the, the assignments that she gives her, I'm just gonna skip past this. And like 70% later in the book, I realized the this task is the whole plot of the damn book. 
I still didn't care about it. So I was just kind of like wading through it and skim, 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 skim. And I finally just skimmed a hell of a lot. And it was like, yeah, I, I don't I don't give a shit about anything that happened there. So whatever. It's not that Aaron's a bad writer. It's just that the plots and the characters don't interest me. Except, you know, it's funny. Like, I kind of complained about it being a romance. But except the one thing that I care about is the romance between... Javi and uh, Bryn? Is it Bryn? I think it's Bryn. Because it's like, you know, the whole she's gone for seven years and he was off to become a king and so on, or, or a noble or something. And so it's like she has no reason to expect that he would stay waiting for her, but he did. And I was like, oh, that makes him kind of an interesting character. Like, I'm, I'm curious to see where this goes. And the cliffhanger that they get dang that gets dangled at the end is he's like, okay, look, I want to be with you and I want it to be forever, but I've been pledged to marry this woman so that two heads of state will come together and it'll be a, a you know, it's like a peace thing where we're, we're going to get that through the marriage. And he's like, I'm going to do everything that I can to get out of it, but it's going to take some time because it's going to require some brinksmanship and diplomacy and yada, yada, yada. And so I think the next book will deal more with that plot. Oh, and another thing that comes back, another plot that comes back is, oh, what's what's their dad's name? Menhir? It's not Menhir. Menhir is an English word. Or Mah Mahen? I think it's Mahen. And it's like, there's just nothing interesting with him. It's just a lot of him kind of being like, you know, I was the best father I knew how to be. And it's like, yeah, okay, man. Like, he just keeps getting really dull subplots. And I feel like he's such an interesting character that nothing fun ever gets done with. But, oh, well. So, yeah, next up, we're going to jump a couple more years down the road, apparently, to uh, Fire in the Blood. And then we're going to try out the Reaver. But yeah, we're halfway through the Sundering, and it's like, I mean, I don't know. I don't feel one way or the other about it. I think they're okay so far, and I think they're doing what they need to do. Like the epilogue, part of the epilogue of Godborn tied into what was going on in Adversary, and so that was cool. And in the Adversary, we get hints of uh, who the, you know, the, the Herald and what that means and, and uh, the Reaver and the Sentinel, and it's like, okay, we get at least an idea that this is all going to kind of tie together somewhat, even, even if it's with parties that are disparate and never really work together, per se. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm cool with that. But yeah, we're in the, uh, the final run here, so uh, thanks for sticking with me. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.